verification. So um, you know, with some of the delays, morning, we'll jump right into this and then get going. Thanks, Paul. It's, I don't know if everybody knows Paul and I know each other from way back when he did his fellowship up in Cleveland. Um, but thank you for having me down here. Um, it's been a pleasure being seen the place and getting to meet a lot of you guys. Um, so I was asked to give a talk a little bit about our comprehensive ear ask for spine surgery. Um, make this move. So it's not moving. Do the arrows on the yeah, keyboard it's moving. Yeah, it's not. Why would it? <laughs> So those are my disclosures. So for those of you that don't know what ERAS is, I don't know what everybody's baseline is. Um, ERAS stands for Enhanced Recovery After Surgery, and it's a it's a it's a program that kind of started in Europe probably about 25, 30 years ago in the 90s and really has started taking hold in the United States probably around 2010. Not so much in our fields, but mostly in general surgery and in, um, uh, and it's a little bit in some of ortho joint, but mostly in colorectal and general surgery. And so this is kind of in the last five to seven years started migrating over into orthopedics and neurosurgery, specifically spine surgery, and kind of has become a bit of a hot topic nationally. And I'll talk a little bit about why and uh, what our approach to it because our approach has been a little different than what has been done in the past. So what is ERAS? You know, you talk about these terms all the time, but traditionally the ERAS program is considered something that's multimodal and that you're simultaneously applying a bunch of interventions at the same time or a bundle of, of items. It's not the traditional scientific way of, okay, let's make one change, see how that happened, see what happens with that then make another change and study that. You kind of put together a bundle of best practices, put it in and then, See how that goes. And then when you take these evidence-based practices, you try them out, you collect data, and then you improve on them as you go. But it really starts off with looking at the literature, finding out what you think is the best practices for whatever you're doing um, in the literature and, and bundling those together and starting and standardizing that process throughout the, throughout the operative period. <clears throat> and so what we do is we examine the entire perioperative episode. Now, I'll talk a little bit about how we define that in a second. Uh, figure out why we're doing what we're doing. And, and everything is open to question. You know, something as simple as, you know, NPO after midnight. Why do we do NPO after midnight? Well, there's a lot of data that shows that NPO after midnight actually dehydrates patients and comes to worse outcomes. So why do we still do it? And we were still doing it up until 2018 uh, in our place. And finally said, well, it's part of your ass. Let's, let's change that. So now... Our patients are allowed to have clear liquids up until two hours before the surgery. They do stop eating solids at midnight, but at least they're still allowed to get uh, clear liquids up until two hours before surgery, which is a massive cultural shift. Um, but it's better for patients, and that's really what your ass is all about. Um, and then we standardize the pathways, and then it's an iterative process. So we look at our data, see what works, what doesn't work, and then change it and change the pathway. And continually, you're trying to improve a pro the process as we go. And so what's the data behind that? So probably the biggest trial out there is this one from Kaiser. This is from a few years ago. And again, this is not directly related to spine surgery, but um, looked at 15,000 patients or so, both general surgery, colorectal abdominal surgeries, as well as hip fracture patients. And note and saw a significant decrease in length of stay, decreased morphine equivalents, um, early ambulation increased, improved nutrition, so a lot of good things happened when they did this, and they didn't do a lot. I mean, they just standardized their analgesia, analgesia pathway. They put in early ambulation, and then they standardized their post-op order sets, and they were able to show a significant improvement in their outcomes. And so this is what a traditional ERAS looks like, and this came, comes from that paper, and this is kind of more of a general, general surgery ERAS, and I understand that. <coughs> it's kind of what things look like. There's a preoperative, Preoperative uh, set of inter interventions, intraoperative and postoperative, and then you audit all of those, and you have the whole team involved in this. And so it's really a multidisciplinary approach. Now, one thing you'll notice is preoperative starts uh, on all these things there starts only a day or two before the surgery, and, and that 
to us doesn't really square with how we deal with patients as surgeons. Um, so that's something we kind of started thinking about. But we, the first thing we wanted to look at was what was our what were our goals here? So we really wanted to reduce morbidity, <clears throat> infections, um, readmissions. We wanted to reduce length of stay. We wanted to improve the efficiency of the operating room, not have so many um, patients delayed because they didn't have the appropriate pre-op labs, not have so many patients delayed because they weren't worked up appropriately or were canceled because of that. And we we're really trying to reduce narcotic use. This is obviously in the middle of the the, the narcotic epidemic um, that was raging in Ohio. So we're, there was a lot, real focus on trying to reduce narcotic use as well. So those were kind of our goals. And what we thought the potential benefits were that we would improve outcomes, we'd have less M&Ms, we'd probably reduce costs if we could reduce length of stay and have less complications. We'd improve patient satisfaction, we'd have better communication, they knew what was gonna happen. So that was kind of what we were targeting. And so we started thinking about this and we said, well, you know, most ERAS programs, at least up until that point, and still to this day in spine surgery, concentrate on specific surgeries. So you look in the literature, it'll be ERAS for MIS TLF or ERAS for MIS discectomy. Um, we didn't really know what to pick because we had such a wide range of surgeries. And so we said, well, we would, in an ideal situation, have a comprehensive ERAS that would cover all of our elective surgeries. Um, we also started thinking about, well, how can we affect change better? I mean, we can only do so much in the day before surgery to optimize the patient. What if we start earlier when we originally booked the patient for surgery? And at our place for elective surgeries, most of us are booking about six weeks out. So we have a six week window where we can work with the patient and optimize them. And so, you know, how do we fix, how do we engage that time or use that time to help us optimize these patients? And then obviously the day of surgery, like a traditional ear ass, we wanted to standardize that process and then post-operatively standardize that process. So um, we started our comprehensive ear ass and I'll talk a little bit about how we came to what we did and how, we, how we're doing now. Uh, but we finally got it all in place in 2017. And then a lot of it came in in phased approaches because we took a, a module approach. So we have, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, but we would put in modules up for each different thing. So we had a module for infection we had a module for managing diabetes. We had a module for obesity. And as we put those all together, we finally had the whole thing up and running by about 2017. And so where do we begin? Because that's probably the hardest part of this when you're trying to think of a comprehensive program. There's such a wide variety of surgeries. And so the first thing we had to do was partner with anesthesia. So anesthesia, ERAS really came out of the anesthesia world and they're the content experts, if you will. So I partnered with Dr. Manlapas, who's the perioperative medicine fellowship director mm -hmm. and had a real keen interest in starting an ERAS program for spine surgery. Uh, and so she was our champion on the anesthesia mm -hmm. side, which I think is critical. Uh, she was our content expert on ERAS, not necessarily spine surgery, but on ERAS itself and on the anesthesia part. And really we thought we needed both anesthesiologist and a surgeon champion to get buy-in from both groups because those two groups have to work together to make this work. And we wanted to make it a collaborative effort. So we didn't want any isolated efforts and we wanted it to cover the continuum of care. So really having all these parties buy in was critical. And we started talking about anesthesia and their goals were very similar. They wanted to improve patient outcomes, reduce morbidity. They also wanted to reduce length of stay. They also wanted to reduce narcotic use. And they also wanted to reduce efficient, improve efficiency of the OR. So when you put those goals together and they're the same, that really helps, you know, Create alignment between the two groups, and that was the, that was the starting point. We all agreed; we all have the same goals. But then we looked at the perioperative episode, and you start looking at that, and you see the pre-op, the post-op. That's a very long continuum. If you think about a spine, elective spine surgery, see a patient off from surgery six weeks ahead of time, you book it. Six weeks of pre-operative period go by, where you could be doing stuff with them, you're sending the cardiologist and the pre-op clinics. You have the day of surgery when the anesthesiologist actually lays hands on them um, and then maybe a day or two post-op where the anesthesiologist may have some hand in, them, in their care. And then you have the post-op period, a 90-day post-op period that we're all working on. So for the anesthesiologist, the surgical episode was really maybe a day or two before surgery to a day or two after surgery. For the surgeon, it was six weeks before to three months after. So it was a very big discrepancy there. We needed to bridge that gap. And for us to get buy-in with our surgeons, we really needed to include the pre-op and post-op as well, because that's that's really when they're touching touching the patient. 
And then we also started going digging deeper. And although many of the interests are aligned, there are a few things that are different in what the anesthesiologists are looking for and what the surgeons look for. Um, we both want efficiency in the OR on that day. We're all thinking about our equipment. They're thinking about their anesthesia machine. We're thinking about our OR equipment, making sure everything's in the right place and working order. But when you start thinking about how we think about a surgery, most surgeons go into surgery not thinking that the worst is going to happen. You're thinking that this is going to be great. We're going to go in. We're going to fix their deformity. They're going to do great. We'll be out by 2 o'clock with minimal blood loss. They'll go home post on day three from their scoli. Anesthesiologists come into every case thinking the worst is going to happen. and They're preparing for disaster. So you have, you're coming at it from two different viewpoints. And we really had to adjust to that in our thinking and in our communication. And so we needed to speak the same language. And if you think about the anesthesiologist concerns on the day of surgery, they're thinking about blood loss, the length of the surgery, how long is this going to take, what position are they going to be in, because I need you know, lines and access, um, what kind of comorbidities does the patient have, and what am I going to do for their post-operative analgesia in the PACU. On the surgeon's side, what we're thinking about, because we've already thought about their comorbidities ahead of time, we're thinking about how long is this going to take, what technique am I doing today? Do I have all the equipment I need? How am I going to do this? And, and, and actually going through the procedure. I'm thinking about the steps of the procedure as we go through. So we're not even thinking about the same things on the day of surgery. And so the first things we had to do, was, first thing we had to do is really learn the same language. Because when we talk to a patient, when we talk to the anesthesiologist, I'll say, look, I'm going to do a two-level T-lift. Anesthesiologist has no idea what that means, unless, they've been do unless they're really, really well-versed in T-lifts. Um, what they really want to know is, you know, how long are you thinking the patient needs to be under anesthesia and how much blood loss are they going to have? And are you going to be near any major vessels that I have to worry about? So we created a standardized nomenclature for our system, first and foremost, just to ease communication. We based it on predicted blood loss. And you can see we have minor, major, complex. And we just went through all the different surgeries we do and kind of categorized them into the, one of those three categories. And those three categories really dictate what our preoperative clearance process is, and what our day of surgery practice is, uh, depending on where they fall in one of those three categories. And then we had to get buy-in from the anesthesiologist. We had to make sure that their interests and their concerns were, were included in this. And they're worried about the continuum of care, obviously, but they're worried about pain control, postoperative nausea and vomiting, blood and fluid management, and obviously opiate crisis. So those were their primary concerns that we had to address with this, with this pathway. And we had to make sure it was data-driven um, so that you know, we were being scientific about it a little bit and get by it. Because the only way to change people's practices and minds is with data. I mean, if you show a rational physician that this way works a lot better than this way, most of them will switch. Um, just telling them to switch doesn't always work. And then we also had to... Um, like I talked before, we needed to, to base our preoperative and data surgery, day of surgery protocols on those categorizations that they, they used for blood loss. So, you know, th that dictates the need for blood management, that we have a preoperative blood management pathway where we check to make sure people aren't anemic ahead of time. Um, it dictates the monitoring intraoperatively. Are they going to need an A-line, central line, et cetera? It man dictates the fluid management in terms of crystalloids and colloids, depending on the size of the case. And then it also dictates the multimodal pain pathway as they go down. And we also created, created these as more guidelines as opposed to specific pathways you had to follow to allow for you know, professional judgment, personal preferences of the, of the team, and, uh, and for the individualized patient. And so again, we had to do data, it had to be data driven. We used best practices from the literature, which are key. We wanted to monitor compliance, so we were able to use an anesthesia. That's easy. It's a lot easier than surgery because they all have a, a running track record that's recorded for the entire operation, so you can see what they're doing. So we were able to track that, and then it was an iterative process of being able to track that. We look at our outcomes, and then we actually change our, our protocols based on our outcomes. And then we also had to have surgeon involvement. Communication is key here. So this was required some surgeon buy-in, which I'll talk about in a second. But what that required from the surgeon is communication. So we had to tell them what the predicted EDL is. We did that by categorizing those cases and give them a realistic surgical time. Um, the preoperative huddle that we all do, and I'm not sure how you guys do it here, but at the clinic, uh, patient won't go to sleep until the staff surgeon, staff anesthesiologist, nurse, uh, tech, CRNA, and resident fellow, everybody's 
in the room and we huddle around the patient. We talk through the surgery, talk about expected blood loss, talk about blood pressure parameters. The anesthesiologist then goes through what their anesthetic plan is with the patient awake. Um, and then we start, to, then we put the patient to sleep and go. So everybody gets a huddle. We get, we get all on the same page at the beginning of the case. And then um, the other part of this was we really needed surgeon buy-in because what the anesthesiologists were afraid of is that they were going to do all this work and then the surgeons weren't going to do anything and it was going to be a, all on them to kind of standardize their practices but not the surgeon practices. So it really needed to be a collaborative effort going through. And this is kind of an example of why that needs to happen. If you look at our pain management protocol, um, and it, the details don't matter really, but I just highlighted in yellow what the surgeon does and what the, and what the anesthesiologist does. And you can see that there's a lot of stuff at the top and a lot of stuff at the bottom that the surgeon has to do for this to work. If, if the surgeon doesn't buy in and doesn't do that, the whole protocol just goes down the drain. And so you really need both groups to buy in and be on the same page. So how do we get surgeon buy-in? So again, you got to address surgeon concerns. It has to be efficient and improve practice efficiency. Um, you have to be affecting patient outcomes. So there has to be data driven that what you're doing is actually going to help their patients. Um, cost, it, it can't be cost prohibitive and it has to be effective. And so those are all things we had to make sure we're going on with our protocol for the surgeons to be able to buy into this. And so we really customized our ERAS um, to target specialty specific high risk groups in our patient population. So we looked at our surgeon, we got all our surgeons in the room, we talked about, well, what do we think are the most pressing concerns for our patients? What do we need to improve that will improve their surgery? So what are the key factors for our group of patients? Um, we identified those areas and then targeted those era, areas in our ERAS protocol. And some of the ones we looked at were VTE, uh, reducing VTEs. We needed to improve patient communication. We wanted to improve early mobilization, and we really wanted to improve pain control. Um, the other one that's not on there is we want to reduce infections. Um, really, all of this started probably about 2012 when our infection rate, and I'll show you our data, was pretty high, um, and it had been high, and we really wanted to reduce our readmissions, and we found that all of our, almost all of our readmissions were due to infections. So uh, that being the root cause, we started looking at ERAS protocols for <laughs> infections, and it kind of all blew up from there. So where do we start? And so these were all the list of things we talked about when we had our surgeon group hold of what affects the spine, what affects the spine surgery, the outcome of the spine surgery, what comorbidities. So you know, smoking, obesity, diabetes, age, frailty. You could throw osteoporosis into there, narcotic use, chronic pain, anemia, coronary artery disease, hypertension, skin colonization for infections. So all these things were things that were high priorities for us. Now we looked at and I, I color coded these a little bit. We did a really good job at the Cleveland Clinic with coronary arteries and hypertension because we're a big cardiac hospital. So we're really, really good at targeting that. Not so good at targeting any of the other things. The anemia, we had the highest uh, transfusion rate of any group in our hospital, um, the, the spine group, uh, if you look at a per patient basis in form of number of transfusions before we started this. Um, Skin colonization, we had a four and a half per four percent infection rate, uh, which is really high going into this. Um, and then obviously diabetes, obesity, and smoking, we all we all know those effects on spine surgery. So we wanted to target all of these kind of in a staged fashion. We didn't want to fight them all off at one once, which was almost too much. But and so again, we started thinking about well, a lot of those things you can't fix on the day of surgery, you got to start fixing earlier. So we wanted to make use of that long preoperative lag that we have. Uh, since we already have it, we might as well use it. And so we came up with um, some components. So, and this is a, a little bit older slides. We have a couple other ones on there now. So in the preoperative protocol, we came up with modules for smoking, diabetes, anemia, obesity, frailty. And now we have one for uh, osteoporosis as well. And we're just bringing one online for chronic pain. And then we have the intraoperative protocol, which is really driven by our anesthesia team. Uh, looking at using goal-directed fluid management so we don't have uh, overload our patients uh, and hopefully reduce the number of ICU visits. Uh, multimodal pain management, blood management to reduce transfusions and glucose control. And then post-operatively, we wanted early ambulation, uh, a better pain management regimen. And then we also threw in some geriatric management because we had, a for our older population, we had a pretty high delirium rate. And we thought that co-management with geriatrics might help us reduce that. And so what we really needed was we had to get all these other departments involved for this to happen. 
And so that was the first step is we had to start pulling in endocrinology for the glucose management. We have a blood management team that needed to be engaged. Uh, anesthesia, obviously, geriatrics, um, bariatrics for the obesity management, and physical therapy for early ambulation. And so all of these things had to kind of come together around the spine surgery. So really it became a multidisciplinary effort of engaging department heads from all these other departments to create pathways that we could fast track our patients to. Because, you know, the, uh, the issue for us is, you know, our, all our providers are busy. If I send a patient for an endocrine consult for their diabetes, it may take three or four weeks for them to get in to see the provider. And then they start managing them. And you're also now three or four months out from the surgery. That just wasn't going to work. So we needed a way to get these patients in within a couple of days from the time we decided to, to book a surgery so they could get in and get working with them. And so we created kind of standard triggers with the aid of these departments of what they wanted to see uh, to optimize the patients and created fast, fast track pathways to every department. So nowadays, if I, if I see a patient who's got a high hemoglobin A1C greater than eight, we have a standard pathway. We put the order in, we call the patient, they get seen by geriatric, by uh, endocrinology within two days uh, and get started on trying to optimize their, their sugars. So same with geriatrics, um, same with blood management. So we, you know, that that's really key to this because you don't want anything you do to slow down the, uh, the pathway. You really need to try to keep efficiency. And so pre-op, what do we do? So this is a more detailed look at kind of a pre-op triggers. You know, if you got tobacco, if they're using tobacco, if they're smokers, we counsel them on smoking cessation. We tell them we're actually not going to book your surgery until you quit smoking. And we're going to we're going to test do a nicotine test on you. So we actually won't give them a surgical date until they show us a negative nicotine test, and then we retest them right before surgery as well. And we hold that as a hard and fast rule uh, because the minute you start start uh, making a sec exceptions, that, that that then the floodgates open. Now, that, that being said, that's only for elective fusions that uh, don't have neurologic deficits, they're not myopathic, don't have tumors, so obviously we, we make exceptions for urgent and emergency cases. For patients with known diabetes or a BMI greater than 35, we get a hemoglobin A1C. If that's greater than 8, uh, they get referred to endocrinology, and uh, endocrinology asks that we get them in there at least two weeks ahead of time, so they have a couple of weeks to, to try to uh, improve their, their glucose levels. Um, if they're anemic or their hemoglobin is less than that, we should actually drop that to 11 because uh, that was part of the iterative process. We started at 13, now dropped it to 11. We have a blood management pathway where we, we it's an automated pathway for our surgical patients where, um, you know, if they, they get their test and if they're low, um, they automatically get transferred to hematology. We'll order, you know, iron infusions or EPO depending on what their, depending on what their, um, the rest of the blood, blood work looks like. Uh, for BMI, and this has changed a little bit, so BMI greater than 35, um, we're still operating on. Uh, it's BMI greater than 40 that we are, is our trigger to, to refer away for elective surgeries, because at first we started at 30, because the literature says, look most of the literature, that's where the inflection point is for morbidity with uh, obese patients and spine surgery is 30, uh, but we felt that that was too tight of a restriction for our patient population, because we have nobody to operate on if we went down to 30. It's a real problem in Ohio. So, uh, so basically, our trigger now is 40. So anybody who's got a BMI over 40 for elective case gets sent to a weight management program. And then for patients who are 75, they all get seen by geriatrics for their preoperative clearance uh, six weeks ahead of surgery. And they have a whole multimodal pathway for improving nutrition, checking for sarcopenia, checking for frailty, uh, and try to optimize them uh, for surgery. And then our geriatric uh, team follows those patients postoperatively in the hospital and co-manages them with us in the hospital. And so this is, so the, that sounds really complicated. And, and what we realized pretty quickly is that if we rely on the surgeon to order all those things, nothing's ever going to happen because you're in clinic, you're busy, you're not really thinking about that. You offer the patient surgery. They say yes, you walk out, your nurse walks in to give them a surgery date, and, and you, you don't talk to them again until the day of surgery, and out of sight, out of mind, and you don't order any of these things. So we really wanted to make it a standardized workflow that was basically completely hidden to the surgeon, and it would just happen in the background automatically. So 
like many other things for quality purposes and standardizing workflow, checklists work great. So here's an example of the, the, one of the early checklists we had for the optimization protocol. So my nurse has this checklist on her desktop. Every patient that gets booked for surgery, she pulls out a paper copy of this checklist. And when she's talking to the patient on the phone to schedule a surgery date, she goes through this checklist and fills out as she goes. And that way she makes sure that she checks all the right things, you know, for, you know, do they need blood management? Do they need to go to endocrine? Do we need to order hemoglobin A1C? And then we have standardized orders for all these sets. So if you need the hemoglobin A1C, she just sends a little message through Epic to my PA who orders the hemoglobin A1C and tells the patient to go to the lab and get it. And then follows up on that and it automates the order process. So from a surgeon perspective, all this is in the background. I don't see any of this. So it's very efficient for me. Now it's a lot of work for my PA and my nurse, um, but with it being protocolized, it's become routine. This is just the way we do things. Uh, and it's been standardized across all our all our providers in our department now. So it's a, it's it makes it very easy to make sure that we're not missing things on the data search. Um, this checklist has gone through numerous iterations, obviously over the over the years as we've added and subtracted. And we're about to add another thing with a chronic pain program for patients who have been in pain for a long time. We have a chronic pain group that's putting together a, uh, uh, a spine surgery university, if you will, an online course uh, with our pain psychologists for all our preoperative uh, spine patients to, to kind of give them tools to help deal with the chronic pain. And so um, these were the kind of the categories we, we targeted, as you can see. Um, the one that's most mature is infection prevention. That's not on there because we'd actually started that before we started this official ERAS pathway, uh, but that's included in all of this. And then on the day of surgery, a um, whole host of things that we, we looked at, you know, amount of dose, you know, dose of antibiotics, we had upped our actual dose to weight-based dosing rather than a standard dosing regimen. We changed our antibiotic choices based on preoperative um, uh, nasal swabs looking for MRSA colonization. Uh, we started doing chlorhexidine wipes the morning of surgery. So all our patients get chlorhexidine wipes when they do their pre-ops clinic to go home and they wipe down their back day of surgery in the morning before they come in. Standardized the prep because all our surgeons, we had eight surgeons, spine surgeons at the main campus. All eight were doing a different prep. We standardized that um, across the group. Vancomycin powder, we made that an option for all, all instrumented cases and high-risk patients. And then we rearranged the OR rooms. We kind of physically looked at it and said, when they open the trays, where are they opening them? Are they in high flow pathway areas or not? So we rearranged the rooms and made maps so that the techs knew where to open the tables, where to open the instrument trays so they weren't in high traffic areas. And then we added silver dressings, uh, impregnated dressing. And this was part of our antibiotic. This is all based, this is just the whole anti-infection protocol that we have. Um, now, we also added a two-week post-op check by the, the nurses and the, um, and the PAs. They all do a, a Zoom visit now with the patients to check their incision in two weeks. And so all these things were done to help prevent essence, to help surgical site infections. Oral hydration, we talked about continuing clear liquids until two hours pre-op. Um, they're allowed to have Gatorade, uh, and that's been shown to improve glucose control, decrease post-operative nausea and vomiting gastric emptying so they don't have bilious. So all those things we implemented with the anesthesia team. Again, we talked about the nomenclature. Um, I'm not going to belabor all these. I can, you know, if anybody's interested in any specific ones, we can talk about that as well. Um, we did goal-directed therapy to, for the fluid responsiveness, uh, looking at the fluid management because we felt that a lot of our cases were either under-resuscitated or over-resuscitated. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the fact that we have a small group of neuroanesthesiologists do a lot of spine surgery, but we're a fairly big organization. And so you can't ever be sure that you're going to get a neuroanesthesiologist in your case on any given day because they may be on vacation, they may be on post-call. And so we wanted to make sure we had standard ways of doing the fluid management because we would notice that a lot of times when we had someone who wasn't used to doing a big Scully case, you'd end up either way under-resuscitated and you have to go to the ICU because they're on pressors or they're over-resuscitated. And um, swollen, and they were—they didn't want to exhibit it because of that. They ended up at the ICU. So really, trying to hit that sweet spot of ideal resuscitation, so we can get the patient exhibited and not have to go to the ICU. Um, again, blood glucose management, and then blood management. Um, you know, we had, like I said, one of the highest transfusion rates in our in our system uh, for spine surgery, and we really wanted to get that down. So we. 
made a real push for uh, using TXA. So now we have a TXA infusion protocol. Um, we changed the recommended threshold for transfusion to a hemoglobin of eight. Um, and then we use cell salvage for all the major and complex cases. They automatically get ordered for those. And then intraoperatively, they use TEG, uh, which I don't know if anybody knows where that is, a thromboelastogram, where they can, at point of care testing, look and they'll tell you what components of the blood, how, how they're clotting, and if there's if they're off, so they can guide you to add platelets versus cryo versus plasma. And, and that kind of helps guide what you need, to, you need to resuscitate the patient. And then postoperatively, we created a, a perioperative pain management protocol because that was our big thing. So we wanted to have something that was multimodal. Um, it was started up during surgery and transitioned out through the postoperative period. Um, and we wanted to reduce narcotic use in that protocol. And so preoperatively, we give acetaminophen and gabapentin. Uh, a lot of programs gave uh, NSAIDs, but we had a, a lot of pushback on that. So we stuck with acetaminophen and gabapentin for now. Um, they give a lidocaine infusion for the bigger cases. Uh, oftentimes for chronic pain patients, they'll give ketamine infusion intraoperatively as well. We give a ketorolac bolus at the end of the surgery, and then we continue that in, for the first 72 hours postoperatively. Uh, we try to put an epidural pain catheter in all these big fusions. because uh, seem, That seems to help a lot with postoperative pain, get people mobilized quicker. And then we uh, infiltrate the incision preoperatively and postoperatively with, uh, with local anesthetic. We've been using Expro lately. Um, whether that's worth the cost or not is debatable, but that's kind of, kind of our current protocol right now. And then postoperatively, post we standardized our, our mobilization regimen. So we want them up within 24 hours. Um, there's standardized PT and OT protocols on all the order sets. Geriatrics sees the older patients postoperatively as well. Again, we have the pain, pain, thing, pain uh, program as well. So really, our goal was to try to get any patient that was done before maybe 2 o'clock out of bed that same day. Um, we were trying to get all patients out the same day, but we found that the patients who were getting done later in the day weren't getting up to the floor until 7, 8 o'clock at night, and there just weren't enough people on the floor to get them up. So the official goal is within 24 hours, they're up. Really, what we're trying to do is get them up within the first six or seven hours. They're up on the floor if we can. Um, and we got a, we had a, we hired a, a, a person on the floor specifically to walk patients because the nurses were understaffed. So we had someone who was trained as trained by our therapist to just walk patients. So that's all his job is. He goes around and gets people up and walks them around, walk, walks them around the, the hallway uh, to get them moving. And so, how's it going? What what have we found? So. Spy, for the infections, um, this was our first pathway we instituted. We went from a mean of about three and a half percent infections that had been kind of that way for 10 years prior, dropped it down to 1.5 percent, and that's been sustained. So we're now probably about eight years into our, our infection bundle, and we're still at 1.5 percent. So it really has been sustained and works really quite well compared to where we were at before. Uh, transfusion rates, we've seen about a 25 to 30 percent drop in our transfusion rates uh, across all spine surgeries and since we instituted the, 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 the new blood management protocol. Uh, as part of that as well, if you, if you look at our ICU emissions, they're down about 25 percent since we instituted that. So really a drop of 25 percent of patients going to the ICU after elective spine surgery, which is it's not where we want to be, where nobody does, but it's, it's gotten a lot better since we instituted it. And then from pain standpoint, um, the, on the left is the uh, looking at adjuncts uh, for pain therapy outside of narcotics. And you can see a dramatic rise over the, the three years we started putting this into effect in the uh, you know, NSAIDs, Expiral, Toradol, Gabapentinoids. Um, with a, in looking at the pain scores, this is for one and two lumbar level lumbar fusions. On the top slide, you can see that our narcotic use has um, has dropped um, dramatically the first couple of days, um, you know, post-op when we're using all these multimodal regimens. It kind of evens out towards the end once we've uh, when we're discharging the patients. But at least the first couple of days after surgery, we've seen a dramatic decline in the narcotic use, and our pain scores actually post-op day one are much better, and it really hasn't changed despite the drop in narcotics over that time period. So what can we see from what we've done so far? We, I, I think the keys that we take away from our experience has been that the partnership with the multiple specialties is key. And it really ha truly has to be a partnership. Uh, it can't be one driving the other. 
um, you need to have a common language. And I think it's underestimated how different, uh, different specialties think about the surgical ethics. So it needs to be data and literature driven uh, to get buy-in from everybody. And it's an iterative process. We've changed this protocol, I don't know how many times over the years as we've learned, gotten new data and learned new things and what works and what doesn't work. Um, standardization is key. So checklists really help with that. And it's gotta be an efficient process, especially for the, uh, the physicians because otherwise it won't happen. If it slows down the clinic, if it prevents the surgeon from getting through their day in the clinic to, to order all these things, it's just not gonna happen. And so it has to be something when you build it, it has to be efficient and almost automatic so that it doesn't really affect the flow of the, of the patient through the system. And uh, I just want to point out, we've talked about a multidisciplinary approach. These are all people that were involved with the initial um, initial rollout of this. You can see there's a whole bunch of them. So it took a real big group of people from all different specialties to make this work. And uh, with that, I'm happy to, to take any questions. I'll start us off. What, um, looking at all these, I mean, obviously there's a, there's a big pro process, lots of different components to it. Any that you think are really the, the game changers in here? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for us, the intraoperative standardization of fluid management was huge. Um, that really had the biggest effect on our length of stay, admission to ICU um, of anything. Because I think that, that what we found was that before we were had we were kind of all over the map, you know, if, if fluid overload versus under resuscitated, depending, and it really only depended on who the anesthesiologist was that showed up. If it was someone who was experienced doing spine surgery, most of the time the patient would get extubated and go to the recovery room. If it was some guy who was if one of our guys that does urology most of the time and they happened to be covering because someone was out, you know, it was a crapshoot, maybe they'd go over there go to the, get extubated or not, you know? And so I think standardizing those protocols, so it didn't really matter which anesthesiologist you got, they had standard protocols to follow and kind of a game plan um, really helped with that. Um, on the infection side, I think probably the biggest thing was changing our infection, our antibiotic regimen, although a lot, it's hard to say which one did the most, but I think, um, you know, prior to institution of our protocol, you know, our standard practice was just a standard dose of ANSEF. Um, preoperatively, and that was it. And we really started looking at the literature and realizing that, um, you know, we we're way underdosing these patients. If you went by weight based dosing, most adult humans need at least two grams of ANSEF to get a, an active dose. And back in 2010, 11, 12, the standard recommendation was one gram. And so we were way underdosing right off the bat. And if you look at the length of surgery, your, your, your dose, the minimum effective dose dropped. Blood level, minimum effective blood levels drops by about four by four hours. Of so if you've got a six-hour surgery, that last two to three hours, you're, you have basically no antibiotic on board. And so we started redosing at three hours because uh, that's why, because of blood loss, we thought it was probably going to drop quicker than four hours. So, which was a real push because the, the ID folks were, didn't understand it at all, like why we wanted to do that. But I think changing that was huge. So now most patients get two grams. If they're over 100 kilos, they get three grams and redose it every three hours. And I think that's probably the biggest change that we made that was effective for our infection rate. Uh, a lot of other things that could be affecting that, but those are probably the two biggest ones. Um, I think for our multimodal pain um, and our pain pathway that addition to Toradol or Toralac was the biggest one. Um, that's really been a game changer. A lot of the surgeons initially were resistant to that, obviously. I mean, everybody talks about NSAIDs and infusion rates, but there's really good data to show that at least if you keep the Ketorolac dose under a total dose of 180 milligrams, that that doesn't affect the fusion rate. And once you get above that, it does. So our protocol keeps it below that. So we only give Ketorolac in the first 72 hours. And that, that gets you up to about 180, and then we stop at that point. Um, and after looking at the data, I think uh, most of our surgeons are converts. You know, and some of us were early adopters. The other ones have watched our fusion rates not change, you know, and so they've all come over. So now the whole group has switched over to doing that. Now. And, it, and that's been a huge difference as well. I think you know, patients feel a lot more comfortable with that and with the pain than with the narcotics. I have a question about the pre-op optimization, um, particularly with diabetes, the smoking, obesity, frail. Do you guys have any data on 
patients that don't meet your parameters, are they just getting surgery elsewhere or? Yeah, so we're working on that right now. I mean, our, the, the, all these subsets are pretty small, if you can think about them. You know, like if you talk, start talking about how many patients do we operate on that have a, a blood glucose of over eight, you know, hemoglobin A1C above eight before we operate on them. Uh, there's not a ton of those um, out there. And so we have, we're just collecting the data on that. We have a, a project that one of our med students is working on this summer uh, as a summer project to look at that. But, um, you know, that, that stuff we don't know yet. And that's why we really haven't switched it. Um, that's just based on, on um, you know, prior literature from the cardiac literature where they talk about uh, looking at uh, that tight glucose control helps with post-op recovery and reduce uh, morbidity post-operatively. And so based on that, we kind of use the hemoglobin A1C as our proxy for how tight their glucose control is. And that's and so our goal is really kind of the tight glucose control. That's, and there's a lot of literature on that, especially in the ICU literature as well as in the cardiac literature. Um, as you know, we had a talk last night from Dr. Mehta from Rush, who's here with us this morning uh, regarding perioperative blocks. I didn't see a lot of that in your protocol. Is that something you've used that you're thinking about using? The, wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so we had a, uh, one of our anesthesiologists was uh, starting a program using, uh, you know, the peri perispinal blocks, um, but he had left uh, just as we kicked this off. So we haven't had uh, anybody in our anesthesia department that's really been interested in doing that. Um, we did do start doing some tap blocks for our ALIFs. And so we do that now for ALIFs, they all get tap blocks, but um, we haven't really done the paraspinal blocks yet. Um, you know, we haven't had an anesthesiologist interested in that yet. So hopefully once someone is interested in that, we'll be able to incorporate some of that into our, into our protocol. Uh, great talk. I just want to make a, a side comment actually on antibiotics. Um, you know, in the spine literature, whether you're orthospine or neurosurgery spine, I don't know what the the value or the um, <clears throat> kind of the the research is behind using something like um, ANSEF or cefazolin as opposed to some maybe subpar antibiotics like Linda and Bank and whatnot for uh, penicillin, penicillin allergic patients. Um, at Rush, through our orthopedic joint program, we've done a lot of research. Um, and granted, you know, you guys are putting in hardware. They're obviously putting in hardware for bodies. Uh, you know, periprosthetic infection risk is a huge thing. And what I've been trying to really uh, be an advocate uh, for with our orthopedic surgeons, um, and of course, the next step is spine surgeons. What I found in, in a systems wide issue, and you know, our, our residents are very busy, our PAs, everyone gets very busy. A lot of this has to be protocolized, a lot of this is done in the clinic as far as boring antibiotics, but we are really trying to change our culture when we see a pen allergic patient. Our natural um, kind of step, I think, uh, in the past historically is to give them Clinda. And if you actually talk to pharmacists um, across the board and go talk to your head pharmacist, whatever, you'll find that um, cephalosporin cross-reactivity with, um, uh, you know, for penicillins is there, it does exist. Specifically with ANSEP, the nice thing is, or Cefazil in the generic name, is the side chain is actually completely different um, when it comes to that. So it is okay to give ANSEP to a allergic patient. I give ANSEP, especially for our, you know, concierge ortho joint patients who come in and our orthopedic uh, joint surgeons are really pushing and say, no, you know, forget about it. We're giving ANSEP no matter what. I've given patients who come in with, you know, who've had stories of, uh, of, of, of pen, pen allergies where they've had almost anaphylaxis, right? And I say, look, hand hold, we'll be okay. You're in the best spot, the safe spot. We do this, we give the ANSEP, fine, to make ourselves feel better, I'll give 25, 50 of Benadryl up front for the ANSEP. And we get through just fine with giving the ANSEP for, for pen allergic patients. So I would encourage people to maybe kind of look into that with pharmacies <coughs> and really try to work that out as a protocol and say, hey, listen, Get pen allergic patients, we should still be giving hands up for some pass on for a better uh, uh, decrease in post operative. <coughs> yeah, just a quick response to that. Uh, totally agree, and uh, hope our anesthesia colleagues are, are interested in, in that process too. I think that the words you use, protocols and history and lack of awareness, lead to a lot of that. I mean, we used to be able to do that 15 years ago. 
And then, you know, they had that one case that was, you know, had a bad reaction to it in a pen allergic patient. So made a standing protocol that it's not possible. We used to do the test dose of ANSEF um, for all the people who were, you know, pen allergic. And uh, I totally agree, but I think that's, that's almost as much of a mindset and paradigm change as letting somebody drink fluids two, two hours before surgery. It's uh, so ho hopefully uh, that's something we can think yeah, about too. And our oral hydration protocol, which mimics, um, you know, uh, just a uh, protocol is the same. I mean, this is catch and effect. It used to just be a colorectal thing. You know, now it's, it's invading into orthopedic, spine, neurospine, and orthopedic joints. It's all a great thing. And then I'll just say one more thing is that if in clinic you do find somebody who has a an allergy and you have a PA or an NP or whoever seen that patient putting those pre-op orders for their surgical date, um, if it's possible and your institution allows it, have them go see an, um, an allergen, uh, uh, allergist. You know, go, go have them see a, a get allergic testing done if there's enough time between the, uh, there's that time and the operative date. Sometimes people come in with this crazy stuff like lidocaine allergies, uh, people that came, whatever, you know, cane allergies and you know, for boards as an anesthesiologist, you were used to learn that the two drugs that are the least reactive in the body are local anesthetics and Versed, Dazlan. So I find it hard to believe, and it really hinders us on the day of surgery as anesthesiologists when they come in with these weird sort of things. And it's like, wait, my whole primary anesthetic was based off that. So sending them to a clinic to get allergies tested might, might be a good option too, uh, also with the hands up thing. Thanks, Kevin. Dr. Shani, I've met a few comments. Um, talk, great talk. I mean, we've got a, a lot of great physicians uh, from, we've been doing spine surgery here for years, orthopedic surgery here. Uh, so we've seen some of these protocols and, and, and perioperative care uh, measures taken in orthopedic clean joints. We need to look in ways to incorporate this in the spine care that you've shown us. Um, the good things we do developed a really good, strong relationship with our anesthesia colleagues. Tom Murray, my wife, like the senior days who've been here uh, and, and then a lot of this. So we've got a lot of exciting teammates uh, that we think that we can really work together with a sort of multidisciplinary approach, as you mentioned, and, and, and use some of your, your strategies and, and, and structure to be able to develop that here. So thanks again for your time this morning. I know we're running a little bit late. Uh, appreciate this. Thanks again.